Crab Nebula. So we're really excited for this talk in particular. Um, it's a really important topic. It's one of the things that's really going to make this ecosystem grow. So Daniel, take it away. Please give him a hand. You can hear me, right? OK, I can hear myself. So that's a problem of the industry, I think. Um, I'm not going to introduce Tauri right now. I think probably by now you've heard about it. I'll go into some details toward the end. But I know there's a lot of new people to our ecosystem, maybe watching, maybe in the room. And something I only learned recently was why we call the language Rust. right? And it has a lot to do with something that people tend to forget when they're designing organizations and software. Um, at some point, it should just be rusty. And what that means is you're done. And what I want you to think about through the course of this romp through history, what does done mean to you? What does it mean to your organization? And specifically, what does it mean to your software? So I'm Daniel. I was the co-founder of Tauri. Uh, three or four years ago, we started this little project to look more closely at how we're building software. What does it mean to be a software engineer? Um, at a certain point, we decided it's important for the health of our community to form a company around it. That's called Crab Nebula. We've got a booth downstairs. You can stop by for some chocolate or a pen if you want. And I, I used to call myself an open source hardliner. But as time went on, I think I've become more of a realist. And I hope that comes through what I mean later on. Um, I wear a lot of hats, so these are my opinions. They don't necessarily represent my company or my open source project or even my community. So let's start with a joke. What do you call someone who speaks three languages? A polyglot, right? What do you call someone that speaks two languages? Not an American. I'm an American, I can make that joke, but what do you call someone that speaks one language? This is where it's going to get tough. Full stack dev. And before you get offended, like, don't take offense for other people. And this is something I learned really the hard way. Like, you can only really be responsible for your own feelings. Everybody had to start with one language somewhere, right? So you start with one, you learn another. And it's always this, this, this time process, this continuum of starting somewhere, getting somewhere else, and not really understanding how you ended up where you got to. And so we're going to talk about education a lot and learning in this talk. So what we have is an education system that's built by people who've been educated. So we have this historical time frame at which they learned something. And Let's agree, you know, 18th, 19th century, you had to know Latin, right? Like, that was important to know Latin because that's what your teachers learned and that's what the language of the Bible was written in. And what happens for people who are learning is they want to take... I'll, I'll, I'll leave the hangman to you to understand where we're going to go with this to think about and the process is really, really interesting. If you look through the historical lens of history. So we're going to start in the 60s, right? In the 60s, there was a problem. We got to get somebody on the moon. Uh, I think the uh, USSR was working on it. Uh, the United States was working on it. And it's pretty complicated. I mean, it, the computer technology back then was... Uh, Stacks of paper, right? And so, you know, you had to calculate all of this stuff, like how fast are you falling and what's your apogee, all, all of this, this crazy math stuff that people barely understood. And I think the, 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 the first point of this, this little group of slides is when you're inventing something that's never been done before, how do you know you did it right? Well, you count to five. Right? So the, the trick was that you know, there was all these buttons and knobs in the, the lunar lander, and there was no way to know which one was important. And there was one really important button that Margaret designed into the capsule, and she said, hey, dude, before you press this button, count to five. 
And, and I think that that's a, a, an important revelation, or revelation for user interface design. And look what happened to this. The legacy is, are you sure? Take your time to think about um, what's going to happen. You know, do you want to quit? Do you want to continue? Are you comfortable with the risk instead of just blindly pushing the button? So, you know, the 60s moved into the 70s. And I mean, I'm sort of dating myself a little bit, but you remember these kind of classical problems that you had in school where it's a story problem and there's like, how do you work this out? And it's, it's about thinking, but you were never allowed to use a calculator, right? You're not always gonna have a calculator in your pocket, the teacher would say. Well, the cheat code in the 70s were these awesome little pocket watch or wristwatch calculators, you know? Casio made them famous in the 80s, but this is where it really started. And, you know, they, they weren't very ergonomic. It's really hard to use those buttons. The, the math generally worked out. And now, here we are, 2022, the SAT, the Standard Aptitude Test in the United States, now permits you to use a calculator for all of the math problems. For a while, you could only use it for the calculator problems. But now, they're like, oh, come on. Like, you've got it in your phone. You, you can buy a graphing calculator for $200. You can even use an embedded calculator in the test, in the online test. There's an embedded calculator. And so out of this, this kind of necessity to cheat, systems evolved. Now, in the 80s, the, those of you who've been around that long might remember people started charging for software. And they weren't sharing their code with you because that was their business model. Um, Lotus123 was a kind of competitor to what we today know as um, Microsoft Excel. And so the problem is we've got this history in software development that we share. Like everybody was sharing their code all the time. It was an academic thing. Business came in and it was like, ah, oh, no, we're going to hire the smart people from academia, put them into our little ivory towers, have them make the stuff that you're going to use, and what's the hack? Well, I mean, Stallman wasn't the first, and I'm not saying that uh, the, the history of that person is a great thing, but the, the ideas of the Free Software Foundation were that there are liberties that we should have with these kinds of ideas. And that stuck around. And, you know, out of this cheat code of, hey, look, we're just going to militantly share everything, Microsoft now owns two extraordinarily important open source communities. Owns. And, and this, is, this is also kind of interesting because ownership over GitHub is a business model, yet Crates.io requires you to use a GitHub account to create your account there and get your tokens. So in a weird roundabout way, the open source movement has affected business to the point where they just can't avoid it. And I'm pretty confident that there is not a single software company out there or even any company that has no overlap with open source today. You know, that's 40 years later. In the 90s, you would buy a record, or CDs. I think CDs were coming out then. And um, people were making mixtapes. I remember making mixtapes for my best friend's birthday, and it was like the songs we were listening to on the radio. But like, the CDs were so, it was like $15 for a CD, you know? And like, then there were, how do you do? Like, you got no money. Napster, right? The hack was, let's go back to this idea of sharing with each other, and obviously, you know, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act came around and uh, prevented this. Napster, you know, didn't last very long. They were embroiled in lawsuits because of this idea of ownership over content. Turn that into a business model, and here you are with the top most, the top streams on, um, Spotify, thank you, on Spotify, 
that have been played over a billion times. And so, like, there's a problem. We solve it for the community. Industry adopts it. Hmm. Dot com bubble. Now everybody has to have a website, right? Like, yeah, okay, you could build something on MySpace. It's not serious. But look at all that Chrome. Like, y you, you have buttons, you have search fields, you even have little Google hanging out over there. Um, how do you make this stuff? It's like, do I have to do CGI? What, what where, th jQuery. <laughs> Suddenly jQuery comes around and is like, well, you don't need to know XML HTTP rec. You can just uh, use our syntactic sugar. And syntactic sugar is something we're gonna come back to again because it, while it masks the complexity underlying the actual systems being run, it does make things more accessible to people. Now, what happened? It's still around. CVE 2020, if you can't read this, is a vulnerability that exists from jQuery 1.03 to jQuery 3.50, and jQuery is still in the wild, right? And this was updated in 2022. Now, it's not a crazy vulnerability, it's just XSS, which is only relevant if you're on the web. But what happens when you start turning web assets into things that run in web views? <clears throat> jQuery sort of solved one type of problem. There was jQuery UI and then you know, I think we saw Twitter bootstrap show up. What's the hack? Boom, everybody, like frameworks. Let's just solve everything with frameworks and, you know, um, there's too many. Like, I, 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 I wanted to just name a bunch of important ones, even uh, ones that are um, dying out, ones that are ultra relevant and uh, some that the community is critical of. But that cheat code put us somewhere dangerous, right? So I, I know this, this is kind of small. I don't know if you can read it. Let me explain. Because everything is easy, you're just happy to get something that works, right? I think that's the, the mantra of the tens. Works on my machine, works in production, ship it. And this idea of free real estate is something that we're recognizing today where we have these, these minifiers that are reducing the ultimate delivery of our websites, right, of our apps. And, you know, this is a, a, a kind of back of the envelope calculation we did over at Towery when we released the 1.0 where we said, if your app is three megabytes in size and you have... 10 million downloads, your environmental impact is lower than if it's 600 megabytes in size and you have 10 million downloads. It's just simple math, right? You don't even, I did use a calculator, but actually a spreadsheet. <laughs> um, but the, the, the salient point here is that just getting stuff to work used to be good enough, but it's not good enough anymore. And And now we're here in the 20s, like how do you even remember everything you know? How do you remember what you forgot? Like I'm sure I forgot a couple frameworks up there that were really important to me at some point in my career, but I have the sinking feeling all the time that I forgot something. Chat GPT. Now, it's a fact that we did update our search on the Towery website, so now you can find Towery App Store, their data on Mac OS at library application support app name. You can find it now, but this is changing things, right? And, you know, where are we gonna end up? I, I don't wanna like speculate about what uh, the artificial intelligence supremacy is going to do to humanity 
because we're not in the 30s, we're not in the 40s. But what I can tell you is that we are going to continuously face problems, we're going to create cheat codes, and that's gonna have some repercussions. They might be good, they might be bad. So I never said it was easy, I only said it would be worth it, right? May West is, is kind of the, the mantra I have in the back of my head since I've started learning Rust and I'm still learning Rust. I will always still be learning Rust. I don't think I will ever stop being able to learn Rust because it's just complex. How do other people learn languages, programming? So I'm gonna take a little bit of time on this graph. What you have on the left-hand side is people who are under 18, young learners. On the right-hand side, you have veterans, 65 plus. And if you recall, we went back to the 60s in the, the slides where I was talking about the problem, the cheat code, and the result. And if, if, we, if we start on the right-hand side at 65 plus, what you see is everybody's been using books for 20 years. Everybody went to school, on the job, less online, and if we work our way back to the youth of today who are still, generally speaking, in the higher education system, everything is online. Less than half of them have ever used a book to learn something, and The, the crazy part about this, this graph, which I don't understand, statistics lie, right? They lie. If you do the math, you find out that over there, 300% learning material, over here, 242%. And, I mean, I know the person who put this graph together, and I trust their data accumulation skills, but what this is pointing to is that there is a massive deficit for the youth to learn how to do this kind of stuff, how to, how to become a developer. Um, it's not happening in the uh, lower education. You might learn a foreign language, you might learn French, you might learn German, but you're not gonna learn Python and you're definitely not gonna learn Rust. Right? Why aren't you gonna learn Rust? Because the teachers don't know Rust. <laughs> it's not easy. So let's, let's take, a, take a little step back. The next or the younger generation of developers, they just haven't had enough time to get experience. It's clear, They're, they've been around for 15, 16 years and doing things like playing outside and uh, Minecraft. Um, but because the people who are making frameworks put so much work into a solid developer experience, and by solid, I mean, I don't have to think much about it. I'm guided through the process. I learn how I'm supposed to be doing things, and I then do them the right way. This, this syntactic sugar is useful, but we have a sweet tooth, right? The problem with syntactic sugar is we start to forget the underlying principles that are important to good software engineering. Count to five. Define done. And... I don't have a silver bullet solution for this, except my friends, right? What, what we've tried to accomplish in the Towery community is not just being open and accessible, but really working toward becoming friends. And, you know, if you remember back to the tweet about, uh, you know, asking ChatGPT where the Mac uh, data is stored, it's easy to be shy around people you don't know. And if you're shy and you have to say you don't know something, that means you don't know something, so you prefer to keep it private or among friends. And I think that the Rust community has done an amazing job of staying accessible. And so is Lars. Like, if, if you were to come to the Towery Discord, nine times out of 10, Lars knows the answer and he's gonna tell it to you if he doesn't know it, there probably isn't an answer. I'm not saying Lars is our chat GPT, but it's about as close as we're gonna get in, in human terms. And yet, the gurus are 
freaking out because Rust is still really hard. Like, I mean, I, I think Tony was kind of taking the piss a little bit. But when you think back to the way that you learned Rust, and you didn't come from a systems engineering background where maybe you only ever wrote a little JavaScript or maybe some Python, the underlying concepts are very hard and it, it seems like there is a little bit of syntactic sugar that could be applied. And now we have synthetic knowledge, right? So in, uh, without going too far out on a limb, I just decided to ask directly ChatGPT. You know, what are the greatest hurdles that people face when starting to learn the Rust programming language? We all know these. I mean, I didn't need to do it. I didn't need to ask this question because it's something I think we're all aware of. And the fact that the synthetic knowledge generation engine was able to regurgitate this kind of thing means it is well known. And the key, I think, is really slow. Take it slow, count to five. When, when you're building a Rust project, I was explaining earlier to, to a friend, it's like or building software is like building a house, right? And with Rust, if your door is slightly tilted and it won't open, then the whole house falls down. I think that's a gift. And I, I think that where we are as a community is close to accept, like, we have to accept that it's okay to learn and fail and rebuild and rebuild. I'm thankful that I don't have to carry a stack of paper down the hallway. <laughs> uh, I'm thankful I don't have to use a, a, a little wristwatch. I'm thankful that I've had online search for decades because that online search has helped me find the answers to problems that I was too ashamed to ask my friends, to out myself as somebody who doesn't know something. What's our legacy as the Rust community going to be? This is a couple years old, but I, I, I come back to it too. How, how, how long did it take you to learn Rust? A month? <laughs> to be productive in Rust? Three months? Six months? JavaScript? Days? How did we try to attempt to solve this at Tauri? We militantly built our org like we were trying to build software. We separated concerns. We have a working group. We have a board of directors. We have a broad community. And now we started a company to do the things that an organization can't do. We maintain transparency amongst ourselves, but also with the community. We empower access by saying, hey, you committed to Towery. Do you want to join the working group? Anyone heard of, uh, of Tofu, Trust on First Use? I, I think that, that that approach is how we tried to grow our community, where, hey, you're a person, you want to contribute, join us. We have controls in place. We review, we require signed commits. But we trust you to participate and help us help each other build this platform. Staying resilient is maybe the topic that comes up the most when projects fail or are starting to fail or are losing contributors. And for us, resilience has to do with this notion of recognizing burnout, of caring for each other, but also knowing who we are. 
this comes through the reduction of bust factor and the definition of done. When is the Towery org going to be done? People ask us about our roadmap. Um, for us, we take it one major release at a time. And that release is done after it's been audited. It's gone through its beta and RC phase, and it's in the hands of the community. We try to reframe success. I, I love this tweet because it references our Bible, as it were. And what we've seen at, at Towery is People show up, like, I heard about Tauri, this is great, uh, what do I do? Yeah, you install the prereqs, you install Cargo, you install Rust-C, uh, you know, maybe LLVM, depends on your platform. And then you create an app, and it, it runs. Like, we have this, like, based on create Tauri app, you can, with zero Rust knowledge, create an app that is using Rust. And through the use of examples, which is the secret weapon of the Rust ecosystem, through the use of examples, people can do the command C, command V, and understand how things work. And this has the added effect of reframing participation, right? So generally speaking, when you ask someone if they participate in an open source project, the first answer they have in their head is, uh, yes, I have filed an issue, made a PR, and it got merged. And that's participation. And for us, we see community involvement as an extraordinarily valid and important part of participation. And like I was saying about our working group, anyone can join it. And we have some private channels on our Discord, which help us discuss things about release strategies, revisions, and we grant access to the GitHub org. Because I'm gonna be honest with you, as a security concerned person, I don't like reviewing forked PRs. I don't. Um, they are dangerous. I prefer signed commits from known contributors working on a branch. <clears throat> and the most important thing that I've seen over the three years at Towery is people who start as learners grow into teachers. It's, uh, it, it, it happens because people want to give back, right? So the first entry point to Towery is the Discord. Um, maybe Twitter, but Discord is where you can meet us, learn about the project, and become involved if you're a chatty kind of person. Um, if you're more interested in learning about the Towery program within the Commons Conservancy, which is the uh, entity that protects the code base, uh, you can look us up at the, the Commons Conservancy. It, we have a board of directors that are elected and a pretty robust process for making decisions about how the governance of our organization works. There will be elections this summer, if you're actually seriously interested. And we also have an open collective for donations. I think it's also linked up now with GitHub sponsors. And I left a lot of time at the end for questions, if you have them. I know there's also lunch coming up. Um, you can visit our web or Towery apps on Twitter. Um, I'm thankful that you were here and that you paid attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniel. And as, as he says, if you've got any questions, then uh, just raise your hand and uh, one of us will come to you. Um, listening 
to what you were saying, I had a thought. Um, would you say that part of the reason we're so welcoming as communities is because Rust started off difficult, so everybody knows that it's difficult, and so everybody knows that that person's probably going to have trouble learning it. And so we're all aware of it, we all experience it, and thus we're more willing to be open about it and more just come and join, and you know, because we all know what it's how difficult it is. Would you think that if Rust hadn't been so difficult at the beginning, it would had, would not have been as you know as welcoming because people would be oh it's easy so anyone can learn if you can't you're an idiot whereas rust is it's difficult we know it's it's got a learning curve like a cliff you know you're going to smash your face against <laughs> it we all've done we've all done that so we know what it's like and we're more empathetic as a consequence so I'll, I'll try to reiterate your question um, do I think that the challenges of becoming a rust engineer that we have all faced has added to the welcoming nature of the community because we know that you're going to be beating your head against the wall because of borrowing. <laughs> and yes, but I, I think that the genesis of the language and where it came from also came from a mentality that was really focused on open source. And the, the, the promises and dangers of open source if I beat my head against the wall, am I going to try and stop my grandchild from beating its head against the wall? Absolutely. My mother used to say, well, you're going to burn yourself once, you won't do it again. And, I mean, I think that the interesting part of our community that isn't talked about as much is our acceptance of gender fluidity and LGBTQ, I, I recognize that those um, energies from larger companies that, or, or even status quo, push people like us out to the edge, right? And Yeah, I guess we have all been. It's a good point. Yeah, I'll just say yes. <laughs> um, you mentioned how the Discord is sort of the entry point to the community uh, for you guys. Do you have any anxieties about using Discord as a platform as that entry point? We did. And there was a point in time where we discussed moving over to a uh, matrix client and it was kind of too late. Um, I think today, we, like, if we were starting today, we would probably have chosen something like matrix or even a, a self-hosted rocket chat or, or Zulip. I mean, I think of all of those, Zulip is probably the greatest. I love it. Um, I wouldn't take matter most. I guess the, the, the problem is also the network effect of Discord because it seems like every project was on Discord back when we started in 2019, you know? Like, uh, View Vixens is over there and, and uh, the Rust community is over there. Everybody in software development seemed to be on Discord, so it felt like a good place to go. Am I happy with the fact that everything that you upload is available on a public URL download? Not really. Um, is it a, a private chat? No, it's a direct message. Um, do we have any guarantees that it's going to be around forever? Also not. Am I nevertheless a Nitro sponsor of a bunch of different servers? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's this kind of weird situation where actually, from my perspective, the programming community co-opted the Discord gaming community because that's what it was ultimately for. And I mean, if Discord is out there, love it. But these rooms that are available right now, they don't work so great. I don't know. We're, we're probably going to stick around. Uh, that is not really a question. I'm just gon going to add, uh, while you were talking about Discord and alternatives, we're also on Mastodon under the same handle. Um, so if you, don't, if you prefer to use that, uh, we are also on that. Right, Jonas, th thank you. Um, I would also like to point out that Jonas is going to be giving a talk at 2.15, a little workshop about building a Towery app completely with Rust uh, without any, I believe, without any NPM ecosystem at all. So if you want to check out uh, Towery and you, Y-E-W, head over there to check, check out that talk. 
Uh, what advice would you give to someone who wants to start contributing to open source uh, projects in Rust, but they feel like some of the issues are like way too complex to actually add something valuable to to the project, and like somehow that prevents them to, you know, uh, gain experience, right? In Documentation. If you're afraid of the, the degree or, or complexity of the fixes that you want to apply, then get to know the team through documentation PRs. They're always welcome, and you get the added benefit of slowly becoming a domain expert. And once you're a domain expert, because you've read the code and you've written the documentation or you've adapted the documentation, you will then become in a better position to ultimately not only communicate with the people who have the ability to merge those PRs that you one day want to make, but will also be making a very viable contribution to the community. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks very much for talk. Uh, question on what your vision is with the problem cheat code industrial adoption and where you're at at the moment let's say in the context of the frameworks with Towery, uh, and also what are your next steps, what's your ambition, or what do you see uh, that you, you guys will do next? I, I think the cheat code is, and you're gonna hate me for saying this, I hope someone picks up on the idea, but better cargo compiler errors. I, I think that that's the huge key, cheat code <clears throat> to making Rust more accessible for beginners. <coughs> Excuse me. Do, do you find that um, with ChatGPT or with like Copilot that that would assist the developer more than having to do a compile and, and see the error messages? <laughs> like, is, is that the next step? See, I, I think that that is the, the, the cheat code I was alluding to in the 20s. Um, I'm... I'm a technologist. I, I use the technology that's around. I build tools, but I also enjoy using tools. And right now, the ability for these neural networks to not only understand the context of where I'm working, but also provide viable feedback or insight or even suggestions is something that's never going to leave our developer experience. I, in, in the contrary, I'm quite confident that it is going to change the way we work. It's not going to make us irrelevant yet, but it's also in its infancy. And I can give you an example trying to answer your second question about where do I see this going and what, what would I hope for. And we're tired of a web view at Tauri. We're tired of a web view community and by that I mean WebView2, WK WebView, and WebKit GTK. We're tired of that community without really any standards or cohesion or, or, or unified system. It's different on every device, and it, it helps us in our mission, but in the not-so-distant future, we look forward to enjoying a servo-based WebView, servo view perhaps. <coughs> Excuse me, I need a water. Um, uh, and the reason for that is shared memory. Mm. Having a cohesive web view ecosystem across all platforms, including mobile, provides us with the benefit of knowing how it's going to work and look, even if it has issues. If it's the same issues across platforms, we can work around them. And Maybe that's my personal definition of done, right? Like, Tauri has a built desktop, it's built mobile, it's unembedded, and it runs in a Rust-based, pure Rust-based web view on all platforms. And for me, that roadmap, I guess, is something that's gonna take us five years, six years, but it will help us stay relevant over that time. <coughs> Excuse me. Did I answer your question? Yeah, it was really good. Um, yeah, I've, I've not used. I was just thinking about the, the the mobile stuff. I've not seen that yet with with Tauri. So, 
It'll be interesting. It's, it's in alpha right now. It's on the next branch. We've got a, a bit of a documentation how to work with it, but it's going to be promoted to beta later this spring and then shipped off to external audits and then landing in the 2.0 later this year. It's very cool. Thanks. There's a question up front. Um, just going back to learning Rust, and I wonder what you think of um, one thing you could say about Rust is it kind of deliberately makes some things harder in the sense that it biases more towards telling you up front that something's going to be a problem and actually ask you to, for to fix it there rather than like discovering it later. I'm wondering like how much that ties in with like maybe we c there's a minimum level we can make it easy because Rust deliberately makes it a little bit harder to begin with. Kind of thing. Rust is a language designed by and written for software engineering professionals. And no German carpenter that I know would ever start building something wrong. Every step is deliberate and perfect, and it's going to support a house for hundreds of years. And the, 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 these barriers to entry, I, I don't think they should go away. I think it's a really valid learning approach to getting it right from the beginning. Can we make it a little bit easier to understand, a little bit less cryptic? Definitely. But losing that guarantee of it compiles, so it runs, is something I would personally miss. Just to be clear, I like that too. Um, but what I was more getting at is that, that maybe means when, when selling the message of how, re how easy Rust can be, we, we can't really compare ourselves against JavaScript because JavaScript is trying to do something different. So someone thinking Rust is going to be as easy as JavaScript, they might still get a shock no matter how good we make our systems. Right. Well, when, when you have someone who wants to learn something, they have to get something out of it. And the delayed gratification of this three to six month plateau before you're actually <laughs> uh, someone who would consider themselves competent in the language is this type of delayed gratification that doesn't work for people with Instagram thumbs. I'm, I'm one of them, I, I can say that. You know, I, I love my feeds and I love learning and reading and watching, but if, if my user interface takes three months to click through, I'll probably go buy a new phone. <laughs> and, and, and maybe there are easy wins that we can make on these inroads. And, in my experience, Towery is one of those approaches where you've built a Towery app, you've installed the compiler. You've used Rust. Are you a Rust developer? Well, write a line or two. Copy paste. You're a Rust developer now. And this, I, I agree with both of the comments in the front that yes, it's hard and everyone has to go through it. I, I think that that risks the this, this idea of it's always been hard, so it always has to be hard, so it's going to be hard for you, and we can't do anything to change it. And maybe, maybe the, the cheat code for Rust hasn't been found yet, but if there was one, I think it would be to make users on, uh, like experience like a slow incline, easy wins. And I always tell people, take the Rust things course. Because I think what Rustlings did really well is provides a kind of learning with the compiler. You know, don't be afraid of the compiler. It's actually there to help you. And at a certain point, you're going to have to go to the, the documentation. But that, that learning method is useful if all you're ever going to do is be banging your head against the wall. Any more questions? Hi, Daniel. Thanks for the talk. Hi. Um, I have a question on how Towery manages to interface with the various operating systems in a security context. So, for example, on, let's say, macOS, 
I assume there's specific parts of the system that you might only be access might only be able to access with something like the uh, I think it's called Kodoa or something. Um, how does Towery manage security vulnerabilities on the, that framework if you have to interface from it from Rust? That's a really complicated question. Um, I, layers of security, right? So the the first layer is our accept list, which if you don't accept any lower level API functionality in your app, it's just tree shaken out of the app. It's not compiled into the application. So if you as a developer don't want your users to have file system access, then you just remove that entire uh, functional tree from the ultimate binary. Now, on, on Mac specifically, there are controls set during the build phase from Mac that require you to grant entitlements for certain features and functionality. The sticky part, and I'll be honest with you, the sticky part is what version of Safari are you running? What version of Safari is your user running? And, and this sort of hints at our general dis dissatisfaction with the various web views, right? Um, if there's a, a vulnerability in Safari or WK WebView, update your system. The reason why we thought that was a good idea, and I still think it's the best we can do right now, is that generally speaking, people are more likely to update their entire system than all 35 apps they have running. Is it a perfect solution? No. Should we have everybody using Safari Apple developer release cadence? Also probably not. So the, the, the panacea of Rust solving everybody's problems because it's a memory safe language with strong typing is risky because you can always write vulnerable code. And you can always be running on a compromised system. And I mean, it's gotten to the point now where I don't even trust my own computer, right? Like, and, and maybe that's something that, that we should find a hack for. Like, how can I trust my own device again? You remember, like, a couple years back, 20, almost 20 years now? You shouldn't Google certain words because it'll put you on a watch list, right? It had that chilling effect. And... When we can't trust our own devices and we're required to use like oh, remote APIs and, and cloud flares and, and, and databases that we don't own, it puts us as users in this sticky situation kind of like at Discord where you know, we can't really get out of it now. And I personally think that the most beneficial approach for modern development is to go local first. Trust your users with their keys and their passwords and their databases and only sync if it's required for the system. You know, offload processing to the place where the processing is needed and the storage where the storage is needed instead of locking people into business models because that's, that's what cloud is there for, right? It's there to, to sell more hardware and to lock people in uh, to, the, to the vending of of these companies, and they might be using open source, but you still don't own your data, right? And I don't know, I like, I like to share a lot, maybe I overshare sometimes, but I wanna decide who I share with. And, and I think that that kind of, of mental model is just as important as making sure that my program compiles. This is what we were talking about when I said design your org like you're designing software. Think about do I need to send uh, a CVE if I find a vulnerability? Like, do, do I have a responsibility to the greater community to protect our natural resources? Is secure enough good enough? Like, I, I, I really wish that our developer experience today, and it's something we're working on at Towery, but I really wish it would be more helpful in telling us that's a stupid idea. 
<laughs> Why don't you do something smarter? Why don't you do something more secure? Now, I might have gone off on a tangent, but. Thanks. If there's, uh, if there's no more questions, then can we have a round of applause to say uh, thank you very much for the talk. Thank you.